which comes to us today from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, and you can follow along in the Pew Bibles on page 1540. This is the word of God. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but not, did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us, and you, instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him and the wedding banquet, to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others came, sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. So I got a question for you. How many people looked underneath what's in here? <laughs> How many people were sitting there trying to figure out what's underneath here? Well, I'm going to show you. I purposely put something on it so you could see through it. Anybody want to guess? What is it? <laughs> Hydrogen peroxide. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm either going to clean the place up or blow the place up. <laughs> nope. It's uh, an oil lamp, oil, and a wick. And here's the remaining part, the lighter. So... I want to talk about this for a minute. This is like a two-part sermon. First, I'm going to talk about this, and I'm going to tie it into the message or the passage that we read this morning. And, but for the last few weeks, we've been talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want to use this to kind of show you what they are. We'll start with this. We know what this is. This is a wick. It's like a, a rope. This is something I can hold in my hands, right? I can show it to you. It's physical. I can behold it, okay? This is like Jesus, the body. It's something we could see. Historians wrote about him. The Bible writes about him. It's something tangible that we can hold in our hands. Now, this is oil. Can I hold this in my hands? Well, in the bottle I can, but if I pour it out, it's going to run all over the floor, it's going to, it might sit, a little bit might sit in my hands, but I can't, even if I go like this, it's going to run out through my fingers. That's not something I can really hold on to, but I know it's there. I can feel it. Okay? How about this? Can I hold this in my hands? That little part right there? No way. No one can hold fire in their hands unless it's with something, some other physical device. In fact, fire, if we shine a light on it, doesn't cast a shadow. It's pure light. You, and pure light does not cast a shadow. If you take a match and you light it and you put a light in front of it and look at the wall behind it, you won't see the fire. You'll see the match stick, you won't see the fire because it doesn't cast a shadow. So this is the Father, this is the Holy Spirit, this is the Son. And now I'm going to show you how the three work together as one. If it was completely dark in here, we had all the lights off and the sun wasn't shining. Oh my gosh, that's very high. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that part. <laughs> um, the power of God. It would light up this room. Darkness is the absence of light. God is light. And his light shines within us. And... This lamp doesn't work, it doesn't shine in the darkness without all three parts working together. If there was no oil in the lamp, I would light the wick, it might burn for a few seconds and then it would go off. If there was no fire, then it would just be sitting here with the oil and the wick 
And if I didn't have the wick, there's no conduit for the, the oil to interact with the fire. They work together, three in one. One light, one physical thing here, but three different parts working together. Not three individual parts that are separate, but three in one. This is a lamp. We're talking about God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, as this burns, if I let it go, eventually this wick will burn down to where it's just coming out of, I don't know what this part is called here, but it will burn up so that it becomes like ash. And if I try to light it again, unless I move this little handle right here and move the wick up a little bit more, and, if, and the more I move it up, the higher the fire gets. But if I don't do that, it'll eventually burn down, and I have to, you ever heard the term trim the lamp? It's cutting off the top part that's burned off and throwing it away so that new parts can be created. God tells us in the Bible that he will prune us when we're not producing fruit. He will prune us. It reminds me of my great-grandfather who had apple trees. And if you've ever seen an apple tree, you know that they can get real heavy on one side and, and on the other side maybe not so heavy and they're really light. And those heavy branches might break off and fall to the ground. So what he would do to prevent them from getting heavy is he would not cut them off, but he would prune them. He would take out little branches that were starting to form and he'd go to the other side of the tree, and he would graft them in on the other side of the tree to try to balance the tree so that he never had broken branches. But if it got to the point where that branch wasn't producing fruit, then he would cut it off. And that's what God does with us. He trims us. He prunes us so that the fire can continue to burn in us. He trims the body, us physically, changing us, altering us, so that we can produce more, so that we can burn for him. But we've got to have the Holy Spirit within us. We've got to have the fire of God ignited in us. And we've already got this part. We're here. We're here today, right? We're physically here. We are ready. So how do we get the Holy Spirit within us? That's why I want to tie in today's, I'm going to let that just go ahead and burn out. I want to tie in today's message. Uh, you know what? Let's let it go a little bit more. Warm it up in here a little bit. It's kind of chilly. Right at the beginning of this passage, I'm going to read it again. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Then. Then what? What a way to start a, a chapter, right? There's not chapters and verses in what Jesus spoke. He was talking about the end. Matthew 24. He's talking about, be ready for his coming. Matthew 24, verse 42. Therefore, be on alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. And then he's talking about that. Then he says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like, and he compares the kingdom of heaven to 10 women who have lamps, five are wise, five are foolish. Now, just real brief moment I want to explain. I can't take time to get into this, but for a brief moment, the significance of 10. There was a civil war in Israel way back after the time of King David, after King Solomon. There were two kings, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and they didn't like each other. And they didn't. Jeroboam said, we're not coming to Jerusalem to, to worship. We're going to do our own thing. So Jeroboam took 10 kingdoms, or 10 tribes of Israel. If you remember, Jacob had 12 sons. They were known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus, to mimic that, chose 12 disciples. So they took 10 of them and went to the north, and they said, we're the northern kingdom. We are Israel. The other two, Judah and Benjamin, they said, well, we're Judah. We're staying here. We're doing it the right way. Okay? So they split. 10 plus 2 is 12. So over some time, the 10, God says, you're out of here. Scattered them across the entire world through the kingdom of Assyria. Never came back. He took the two, sent them to Babylon for 70 years, 
and brought them back. We read about that in Jeremiah, among other places. But they came back, and they, when they were in Babylon, they started to be called Jews. They were Hebrews. They were Israelites. But they were called Jews because they were from Judah. Okay? So that's where we get the term Jew today. So not all Israelites are Jews. Not all Hebrews are Jews, but all Jews are Hebrews. So they were split. So Jesus comes back or comes to, to earth, and he says, I have come for the sheep of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All those people that got scattered abroad, I'm bringing them back. So then he compares the kingdom of God to how many? Ten virgins. There's a significance there. He's talking about us. He's talking about all those people who got spread out. And I tell you what, if you want to conquer the world, you take some of your people and you throw them out in the world and let them live, show them the way you live, the way you were taught, and then you bring them all back in. Oh, brilliant, God, brilliant. So anyway, there is a very, very common misconception about this passage and other passages like it. There's a passage, a parable in here about the wedding banquet. And Jesus, or the man holding the wedding banquet says, go out and find people out in the street. I don't care who they are. They bring them all in because the people who were invited said, no, we don't want any part of that. The Jews said, we don't want any part of what you're bringing. You're not our Messiah. So he went and said, well, go out and get everybody else. Bring them in. But there's one guy who didn't have wedding clothes on. He said, kick him out. He doesn't have wedding clothes on. So immediately, this is taught in churches all over the place. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's wrong. Yes, I'm saying that. It's taught wrong. I know I'm making a very bold statement here. And trust me, I argued with God this week. I don't want to say that, God. Say it. He was very clear. Say it. They're not thrown into hell. These five virgins who don't make it in, the door shut. Okay? While they were on their way to buy the oil, the groom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the virgins also came saying, Lord, open this. Open up for us. But he answered, I don't know you. So throw them out. They're out. No, they're not in hell. That's not what that means. Where that comes from is we as a church, and I'm talking not the, this church here, I'm talking, I don't care what denomination you go by. As, as Pastor Ian would say, big C, or like this, I guess it is, big C. I'm talking about that church. We have taken Matthew 28, 20. It says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, we need to do that. That doesn't mean go out and get them to say the sinner's prayer so you can say, that's another one that I've saved. That's not what that means. He said, make disciples. Not save them, make disciples. There is a difference between salvation and discipleship. If I were to use this, I pour this onto the body, that's salvation. The Holy Spirit comes in enters into your heart when you believe, when you repent, and you say, God, I want you in my heart. You're sealed. I'll bring the sponge back out if I have to. <laughs> You're sealed, okay? That's salvation. That's not the end. That is only the beginning. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Make them disciples. Here's a real-life example, okay? Do you know who Elon Musk is? Some of you may know, some of you may say, I've never heard that name before. He is, uh, among other things, I think he made a car. Uh, I don't really know a lot about the car. But he's also put a lot of money into a space program, and he's working with NASA to send people into space now. Okay? So that's, he's very rich, very well known. I know who he is. If I go up to Elon Musk and say, hey, Elon, it's Phil, you know, hey, we're the same age, man. You know what he'd say? I don't know you. I don't know who you are. But if I start working with him and acting like him and doing things that he wants to be done, and I start really getting close to him, and I go up and say, hey, Elon, he goes, hey, Phil, how you doing? He would know me then, right? That's a disciple. That'd be like being a disciple of Elon Musk. If I start doing everything he does, and trust me, I'm not going to, because I'm not sure what he believes about God, but if I did, I would be like a disciple of Elon Musk. So if I just say, 
Yeah, I know who Jesus is. Yeah, praise God, Jesus. I'm saved, yeah. Nothing else. That's it. Yep. You know Jesus? Oh, absolutely. You know Jesus? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I do nothing else. I'll go to heaven. Absolutely, 100% guaranteed, sealed in the blood of God. You're going to heaven. But are you a disciple? Most likely not. If you're not acting like him, if you're not mimicking him, if you're not following him, making him part of your life every day, he's going to say, I don't know who you are. Matthew chapter 7, away from me, I did not know you, but I did all this in your name. You did it for you, not for me. There's a difference. So I don't mean to scare you. Stay with me. I'm going to bring you out of this. Okay. So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? We have to first understand the difference between salvation and discipleship. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together for both. They work in our lives for both. The Father at the fall said, I have a plan. I'm going to send my Son, and he's going to redeem you. He's going to take sin and remove it from you and draw you back to him. That's salvation. That's the belief. That's the saying John 3.16, for whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's salvation. That's easy. That's real easy. Discipleship can be easy too, but we make it hard. Because first of all, how do you spell the word? It's a big word. Who uses the word discipleship other than pastors? Who uses that word? Okay, we'll get rid of the word. I want you to be like Jesus. I want you to act like Jesus. I want you to learn his ways. I want you to follow him. I want you to show the world who he was. You don't have to call it discipleship, but if you do all those things, you are a disciple of Christ. You have the oil in you. You have the fire burning. You are spreading your light to the rest of the world. But if you just have the oil... The light is not there. Maybe you got a burned out wick. You're just going to be smoking. Smoking mirrors. That's all it is. Thank goodness that thing smoked like that. I could use, I could use it. I didn't know it was going to do that. But what I'm saying is, if you're burnt out like that, are you going to hell? No. I just told you, you are going to heaven. So what's this mean? What's that wedding banquet mean? Okay, so here's what we often, not always, and I don't mean to say everybody gets this wrong. That's not what I'm saying. But a lot of times I hear pastors get this wrong, and it really irritates me. And this is something that God put on my heart many, many years ago, and I never spoke this until today. I don't know why God chose today, but he did. But there is a wedding feast, a celebration for the bride and the groom when we get to heaven. Seven days is typically what the um, Bible speaks of, and that's the Jewish tradition, seven days. Is it seven days, seven weeks, seven years? I don't know. But the important thing to remember is not everybody's going to be in there. Not everybody here is going to be in there. But we're all going to be with God in heaven. This is a celebration for those who were truly disciples, who followed and knew Jesus intimately. It's a special celebration. It doesn't take anything away from you other than you don't get to be a part of this celebration. That's not fair. Okay, let's talk about fair. For, we're going we're gonna to treat marriage as it is between a man and a woman, okay? So if you're a woman and you're not married and a man comes to you, or if you're a man and you're not married and a woman comes to you and says, hey, let's get married. You don't know the person at all. I'm not making some TV show where two people don't know each other get married. We're not doing that. Are you going to marry that person if you don't know them? Are you? Come on now. No! The answer is no. You don't... Okay, if you do, you're foolish. Jesus is not going to marry someone he does not know, who didn't take time to know him. 
Two people get married most often. They take time to know one another, then they set a date, then they get married, then they live their life together, right? They don't just meet on the street and say, oh, hey, let's get married. No, it doesn't work that way if you do, you're foolish, okay? So what this feast is, it doesn't mean that you're not part of the bride, okay? This is a celebration for those who really devoted themselves to the Lord. Now, I know some of you are probably getting angry right now. What is he saying this for? I'm not saying it. This is saying it. This is the authority, not me. This. And we can all read this for ourselves. And it's very clear. If you let God lead you in it, if you let some pastor from another church who doesn't understand this lead you in it, you're not going to get this. Okay? But I'm asking you now, now that I've made that bold claim, I want you to think about this verse, Acts 17, 11. I hope that's right. Or is it 11, 17? I can never remember. I think it's 17, 11. Basically, it says that the Bereans were more noble. They took everything Paul said, and they weighed it against the scriptures to see if he was correct. Take everything I say today, take it to God, take it to the Bible, take it with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and say, was Phil correct? Let him and if you find out that I'm wrong, please let me know so I don't mislead anybody else. But I think what you're going to find out, you're going to say, I never heard of it that way. I never thought of it that way. Okay, there's something to this. Maybe I need to start doing more for the Lord. So what's that mean? How do you get this fire going? Well, first of all, if I were to light this again, i got to cut that ash off. You can't see it right now, but there's a big pile of ash at the top. i got to knock that off because that's not going to burn. Make sure there's oil. There's oil in there. Might put a little bit more in. Maybe have to put more of the wick in. And then I bring the fire and boom, it lights. So let God trim you. Let him take off that dead stuff that's not doing any good. The things that you don't want to do, but you continue to do anyway. You can read about that in Romans chapter 7. But let God just work with you. And it's not going to happen overnight. Okay? But let him... In his time, in his way, and I'm going to tell you right now it won't happen overnight. It took me probably 20 years, give or take, and I'm still letting him trim me off. But it took that long for me to get to where I really felt like, okay, now I get it. Now the light is burning. Now I got oil in my lamp. Okay, and I'm not going to say, I'm going to say it's going to take you 20 years. I'm stubborn. I'm a hardhead. Just ask Tanya. She'll tell you. <laughs> no, don't ask her, please. But <laughs> he'll get her started. <laughs> but it, no, I'm just joking. Um, what I'm saying is, it could be overnight. It could be a week. It could be a couple of years. It could be going on right now. And I know for a fact that it's going on right now in a lot of the minds sitting here right now. Like, yeah, I know what he's talking about. It's God's working on me, fixing these things. Or it could be something that needs to get started. Or maybe you're already there. Maybe you're way ahead. And you're like, yeah, come on, Phil, tell them. I don't know where you are. God knows. So two things. Take what I said about this and the wedding banquet and being left out. Take it to the Bible. Take it to God. See if I'm right. Don't trust me. Trust God. Then ask him, God, where can I be trimmed? Where can I be pruned? What can I do different so that I can start living for you. Now, do not say, oh, I'm too old. No. There was a guy who started a denomination when he was 65 years old, I think he was, maybe, maybe even older. He started the Pentecostal denomination, Smith Wigglesworth or something like that. I can't remember his name. Is that right, Smith Wigglesworth? 60-some years old. He became a follower of the Lord. He started a denomination. It can, you can, I'm not saying you're going to start a denomination. Boy, that's another whole topic. But we will, well, you can do all kinds of things, big or little. You can be a disciple for Christ, even if it's one day. Even if it's one day. Now, I want to tell you one more thing before I finish this, and I know I've probably already gone too long, but I, I just really want to caution you. As you're reading this, and as you're talking to God, searching Google, YouTube, whatever it may be, whatever source you want to use, that's fine. Be careful. There's something 
very, very, very important that I didn't touch on yet. Um, be on alert be then because you do not know the day or the hour. That's in Matthew 25. In Matthew 24, he says, I will come. Yes, there it is. M Matthew 24, verse 44. For this reason, you must be ready as well. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. There are going to be people who are going to say, I used to say this. Jesus won't come until some year in September or October. You know why? Feast of Trumpets. Announce the coming of the king. That's the day he's going to come. Jewish tradition. Leviticus 23. Had it all figured out. Sometime around the Feast of Trumpets. You know why? Because it's a two-day event. You don't know which day and you don't know what hour it starts. It depends on the moon. I said, hey, this is, a, this is a Hebrew idiom. You don't know the day or the hour. That's when Jesus is returning. And then I read that. He said, I'll come at a time when you don't think I will. Oh, you don't have to do that. You, oh, I, and it started clicking in my mind. You don't have to do that. It makes sense, but he doesn't have to. That whole the whole festival is fall festivals in Leviticus 23, and I know you're probably saying, I don't know what you're talking about, and that's fine. Doesn't mean that that's what Jesus has to do. He was very clear. He could come right now. Boom, that's it. And you say, well, what about the seven-year tribulation? What about the Antichrist? What about this? That's man's interpretation of the Word of God. Okay? And when we get to heaven, God's going to say, yeah, you know, here's where your Antichrist was. Oh, it wasn't a person. It was a government. Or I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that that's what God could say. He will explain it all. We may not have it figured out. So don't rely on what other people say. Rely on this and him. The whole three in one. Don't rely on me either. Because I could be wrong. And like I said, if you find out I'm wrong, please tell me so that I don't mislead anybody else. But please, do not think that you got it all figured out and you know when Jesus is going to return and start telling people. Because God doesn't like that. He doesn't want you to be the source. He doesn't want me to be the source. I'm a messenger speaking what I hear him saying to me. And we'll talk more about that next week when I do my testimony. We'll talk about the 20 years next week when I do my testimony. But please, take it to him, because this is for you, individually. Now, if you feel that God is very clear in saying, I want you to tell this people, these people, then do that. Because God does have people that do speak for him and say when things are coming, when things are going to happen. You can, but you'll know when to trust and when not to trust those people if you have a strong enough relationship with God that you know his voice and you know when he's saying yes and when he's saying no, okay? You will know. So make sure there's oil, the Holy Spirit is in you, in your body, and the fire of God can be ignited, but got to focus on what he's telling you to do. Fox News isn't going to tell you what to do. CNN's not going to tell you what to do. Oh, they'll tell you what they want you to do. Only God can be your source. You follow him. You trust him. You live for him. And we'll see each other at that banquet someday. We won't be outside where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Don't feel like you can't be there because every single one of you can be there and you will be there. But I can't do it for you. You've got to take the time to pray, to read the Bible, to worship God, to get to know him more intimately. You don't want to be married to someone you don't know. It's not going to work out. Know him. Know him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving yourself to us, that we can know you, follow you, trust you, live for you, understand you. And at the end, we can be a part of this great banquet. 
So, Father, fill our hearts with your spirit and ignite us for your love, for your freedom, for everything that you have. Lord, don't let any of us walk out of here today without trusting and believing that you're going to work for us. Remove any doubts. Fill us with your love. And then let this day be the day of a new beginning for all of us, every single one of us here and watching on Facebook, so that we can be for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.